when they're born, but they hold nothing. When he dies later on in life, it's interesting, usually they're open and empty. Solomon, when he wrote, echoed this very thing in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 15. He said, as he came from his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. And he shall take nothing from his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. It's very possible that Alexander the Great, the great Greek conqueror, may have understood this passage. He gave instructions when he died that his hands should be visible with empty palms. We know Alexander the Great conquered the world, but he died empty-handed. He couldn't take anything with him. Dr. James Dobson, many of you know who he is. He is the founder of Focus on the Family right here in Colorado Springs. He illustrated this lesson playing the game of Monopoly. He tells the story of how him and his wife Shirley, married in 1960, didn't have many financial problems because they didn't have much finances but later in life they test tasted what it was like to experience the world and what the world thinks is necessary to find happiness in this life things like owning a home and owning a car and having material possessions well one night the family gathered to play monopoly and you know you know with the roll of the dice the Things on the board can either go your way or not go your way. And for James that night, things began to go his way. He was stuffing $500 bills in his pockets, under his board, under his chair. And, you know, boardwalk and park place became his. Soon he was putting hotels and houses and all his property and at the end of that night, he won. But as he was packing things away and his family was going to bed and he was putting the game and all that money back into the box, it began to dawn on him. It was all fake. All the money was fake and, and all the excitement of owning all that property, you know, was just a, an, an illusion as he's putting everything back into that box. And the Lord showed him how often you and I, we struggle to buy and possess things that we could never take with us. Jesus here is teaching his disciples what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ and not just a follower, but a disciple. The word disciple means student, learner. And obviously, if we're a disciple of Jesus Christ and we're to learn from him, we're to be a student of his teachings. And as we just read, and Jesus said to his disciples, he who finds his life will lose it but he who loses his life for my sake will find it and Christ came to give us life and life abundantly he tells us in John 10 10 and his desire for us in finding life and experiencing life to the fullest is to lose ourselves in him and not to envelop yourself in your own will, your own agenda, but in Christ's agenda. Remember in Matthew 6.33, in the great Sermon on the Mount, what Jesus said. He said what? He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Two things that we are to seek first. Notice, his kingdom and his righteousness. He didn't say we're to seek wealth first. Or even seek 
you know, to establish yourself in a career or even to seek a wife first. He said, seek first my kingdom and my righteousness. And then he promises that every other need that you have, he'll be responsible to take care of for you. Putting Christ first. That's what it means to be a disciple. To lose yourself in him. That's what it means to crown Jesus as king in your life and in my life. And Jesus taught that. Putting God's will first. Putting the will of the Father first. He taught that. He modeled it. And now he's giving his, instru- his disciples these instructions as well in their own life before he sends them out to minister on his behalf. And so this morning, if you're a note taker, I want to walk you through our text this morning. And we're going to look at five characteristics of what it means to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Notice, first of all, in verse 32 and 33, notice the disciples reward. His reward, the reward of a disciple in verse 32 and 33 Jesus says to his disciples, Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, him I will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, him I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And what is Jesus talking about here? I want you to understand that he's not talking about your salvation. That if you never confess Jesus before men, it doesn't mean that you're not saved. However, we should be talking to people about Jesus. But it doesn't mean that your salvation is going to be taken from you. You see, what Jesus is talking about here is not salvation, but he's talking about your future reward. Not only in heaven, but the rewards that we receive today the blessings that we receive and experience in our life today by sharing with people and by talking with others about Jesus Christ. That's what he's talking about here. You see, one day in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 15, Paul the Apostle talks about the rewards that you and I will one day receive from the Lord. We're all going to have to stand before him. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, as a believer, we're going to be judged not for our sin, because Christ paid that price for us upon the cross, but we're going to be judged for what we do in this body for the Lord, whether good or bad. You're going to receive a reward or not receive a reward depending upon what you do for the Lord. And so the Bible talks about various rewards that we can receive. And I didn't put them in the slides, but real quickly, I want to give you five crowns that Christ will give as rewards to his saints if you're a note taker this morning. Five crowns. Number one, The incorruptible crown. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 25, the scriptures teach of this reward, an incorruptible crown that will be given to those who are running this Christian race with endurance. And they finish the race. You're going to receive a crown. And then I love this one. It's called the crown of rejoicing, also known as the soul winner's crown. When you lead someone to the Lord, you're going to receive a crown in heaven. 1 Thessalonians 2.19 talks about that. Luke 15.10, Jesus says that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner who repents. And so every time we lead someone to Christ, man, we start a party in heaven. Isn't that awesome? That's probably why it's called the crown of rejoicing, because we're causing rejoicing in heaven every time we lead someone, a co-worker, a family member, a neighbor to the Lord. And so the the incentive to tell people about Jesus, James 1.12 talks about, thirdly, the crown of life. And it speaks of those who endure great hardship here on this earth and are going through great 
trouble and tribulation or endure great temptation here on this earth. You're given the crown of life. And then 2 Timothy 4.8 talks about the crown of righteousness given to those who live righteously and are anticipating and loving the appearance of Christ, wanting and desiring His appearance to come again. The crown of righteousness. You're living rightly. And then lastly, fifthly, it's called the crown of glory. It's mentioned in 1 Peter 5, 1 through 4. This is the crown that is given to elders, pastors, teachers of the word of God. And it can refer to anybody who's teaching God's word. Whether you're faithfully teaching your children at home, or you're a Sunday school teacher or a missionary, whoever you are who are teaching, discipling, and encouraging people in the word of God. You're faithfully feeding God's people with the word of God you're going to be given the crown of glory and so these are the blessings that we're going to receive in heaven but then there's the the blessing if you've never led anybody to the Lord man it's such a blessing to see people come to faith in Jesus Christ as we lead them to the Lord it's such a blessing and we could receive that blessing here now now, why would Jesus say these things to the disciples? Confess me before men or else I'm going to deny you. What is he saying? He says, as you confess me to others, man, these are the rewards. I'm going to confess you before my Father in heaven. We're going to give these rewards to you or I'm not going to give them to you. If you don't confess me before the Father, you're not going to receive these rewards. And Jesus is telling us here, and he's reminding the disciples of these very things. Why? Because he's talking to the disciples in the context of persecution. You see, the verses leading up to this point, uh, he was talking all about persecution, the opposition, the, the difficulty that it is in sharing the gospel with others because people are going to either receive you or reject you. They might throw you into prison. You know, They might throw tomatoes at you. They're going to reject you. And that's why he's telling them here, hey, don't be ashamed of the gospel. Don't be afraid to speak of me before men. Because there's a great reward in heaven. There's a great reward for you. You see, every disciple that Jesus called, he called publicly. In other words, there's no secret messages to the disciples when he called them. He didn't send them a package that said, you know, hey, I'm calling you to be my disciple if you should choose to accept it. This message will self-destruct in five seconds. Boom! Yeah. No, he called them publicly, openly. And just as we call others to Christ openly and publicly, he desires for us to have courage and not be cowards concerning our witness for Jesus Christ. Because we can confess him with our lips, with our life, but we could also deny him with our lips and with our life. And we don't want to do that because then we're forfeiting and we're robbing ourselves of blessings here and even a future reward in heaven. Notice second with me. Secondly, the second point in verse 34, his reminder to the disciples here. His reminder in verse 34, notice he says, Do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. And again, he's reminding the disciples here concerning the message of the kingdom that they were to preach. And the message that we are to preach. It's the gospel message, the good news. And the reminder here, notice he says, I did not come to bring peace on earth, but I came to bring a sword. In other words, the gospel message, the gospel of peace, it separates. It separates family members. And he'll say that next in the next couple verses. You and I know whenever we speak about Jesus to anybody, what happens? They're either all ears or they're, you know, giving you the Heisman, right? They want to, hey, step back, man. I, I don't need that from you. I don't want any part of it. 
Why? Because we're confronting them concerning eternity, eternal life. Life or death is put before them. And a lot of people, especially if they don't have an assurance of heaven that they're going to heaven, a lot of people don't want to be reminded about death and about eternity and about their eternal judge, Jesus Christ, that every person will one day have to stand before and give an account of their life. And so whenever we preach the gospel and bring Jesus to people, it either brings acceptance or separation. And they don't want to have any part of it. And so Jesus says, I did not come to bring peace on earth. And I think that's the key on earth. When Jesus came in his first coming, he didn't come to establish world peace on this earth. He's going to do that at his second coming. When he rules and reigns, after his second coming on this earth for a thousand years, Revelation chapter 19 and 20, we'll talk about that. But at his first came, coming, what did he come to do? He came to provide a message to be preached to the rest of the world. And it was the message of the gospel that people either will receive or reject. What is the gospel message? 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4 tells us this is the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sin that he was buried secondly and then thirdly that he rose again from the grave on the third day if you believe that Jesus did that for you that he died on that cross for your sin and if you believe in that message the Bible says you are saved saved from what saved from the penalty of your sin now, I don't know about you, but that's a great pillow that we could lay our head on every night, right? That's peace. That you, if you believe in the gospel and you know your sins are washed away because Jesus paid that price for you, the price of sin, which is death. If you believe in that with all your heart, Romans 10, 9 and 10 says that you are saved. You're safe from the penalty of your sin. And that is a peaceful pillow to lay your head down every night. He came to give us peace. Now, there are things that disturb our peace. And Jesus came not to give world peace, but he did came, come to give everyone who believes in him his peace. And there's a threefold peace mentioned in the scriptures that I want to give to you if you're a note taker this morning. First of all, Jesus said in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you. He's talking to his disciples again. And he says, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. And then he says, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And so for every believer, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ this morning, Jesus has given you his peace. So that no matter what hardship you're going through this morning, you could have peace in knowing that Jesus is in control of your life and your situation. He gives you peace in the midst of the troubled storm. Secondly, the other peace that he gives to us is the peace of God. The peace of God. And then thirdly, peace with God. And by the way, I reversed those. Uh, in order to have the peace of God, we need to be at peace with God. And how do we become at peace with God? But by applying the sacrifice of Jesus Christ and His shed blood on Calvary's cross to your sin. In Ephesians 2.12 and 14, Paul the Apostle put it this way. In the New Living Translation, I read, it says, In those days you were living apart from Christ. He's speaking of us, right? One time in the past, we were living apart from Christ. We weren't serving Him. We weren't walking with Him. He goes on, You lived in this world without God and without hope. But in verse 13, he says this, But now... You belong to Christ Jesus. Though you once were far away from God, now you have brought, been brought near to Him. How? Because of the blood of Christ. 
because of the blood of Christ and you've allowed, you know, you've put your faith and trust in his shed blood to wash away your sin. And it goes on to say in verse 14, for Christ himself is our peace. He is our peace. And so we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. And then we can have the peace of God. You know, sometimes, you know, this is the third thing, the peace of God. How do we experience the peace of God? By giving to God everything that we are, all our trials, all our tribulations, all our worries, the things that we worry about, our financial matters, political matters that we worry about, right? Marital situation, family manner matters, even sports matters, right? See a couple guys with Broncos t-shirts or hats here, man, you're concerned about your team this year. As the season rolls on, you know, uh, if your team is doing good, you, you know, this congregation gets more orange and blue. But when your team starts to sink, what happens? You don't even bring your colors anymore. You're worried about them. And this is what happens, you know, in, in Philippians 4, 6, and 7, Paul the Apostle tells us, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Hey, pray for your team. Pray for your financial matters. Pray for your family. Maybe you have family members that aren't walking with the Lord. And they don't have the assurance of heaven. And they're facing an eternity in utter darkness where the Bible says there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. The lake of fire, Revelation chapter 20. And so we need to pray for our family members. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. This is the New Living Translation. Tell God what you need and thank Him for all He, he has done. If you do this, you will experience God's peace, which is far more wonderful than the human mind can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And then write down this passage, Isaiah 26, 3, one of my favorites. He says, you will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, whose thoughts are fixed on you. And so the peace of God, as we fix our hearts and our minds on Jesus Christ. And what happens when we do that? We start to think about how great is our God. And all of the little matters that concern us fall into perspective, the proper perspective in the view of a great God who spoke this world with the word of his mouth into existence. He could take care of our little problems. When we fix our eyes on him, he gives us a peace that passes understanding. Notice thirdly this morning, verse 35 and verse 37, going to verse 37, he talks about his relationship, the relationship of a disciple of Jesus Christ, the relationships, we could say. Verse 35 says, for I have come, remember Jesus is speaking here, I have come to set a man against his father a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies will be those of his own household and he goes on verse 37 he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me what is jesus saying here regarding relationships he's saying that our relationship with Jesus Christ needs to be the priority. It needs to be first. Numero uno. Not your wife, not your husband, not your children, not your dog or your cat or your parrot. Jesus Christ needs to be first. Not Aunt B, not Opie. Jesus wants to be first in your life. And so we need to give him that first place in our life. And listen, church, this is what happens when we put Jesus first in our life. Every other relationship that you're involved in becomes more and more blessed. I need to realize that I'm going to be a better husband, a better father, a better pastor, 
when Jesus is first in my life, it's going to affect me for the good. And it's going to affect you for, for the good in all your relationships. You're going to become a better worker at your job when you put Jesus first in your life. You're going to become, you know, a better son, a better daughter, a better uncle or aunt when you put Jesus first in your life. And that's what Jesus is saying here. And we need to remember that Jesus was speaking to this into a culture that elevated the family. The father was, you know, the head of the household, the patriarch. And they honored their father. They honored the mother. The sons were awaiting the inheritance of their father. And yet Jesus say, says here, even within your own family, don't move away from your loyalty and your obedience to me, to Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a note taker, write down this passage. We're not going to take the time to look at it, but I want to quote it before you because Luke in chapter 14, Luke 14, 26, Luke says this, very similar to what we just read, but in a, in a more difficult to swallow context. Listen to what Luke writes and, and what Jesus said. He says this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. He uses the word hate. But that particular word in this context means to love less. But it says the same thing, doesn't it? That every other relationship in our life and even loving ourselves, as we look in the mirror, right? Oh, you look good today, brother. <laughs> and we go to the gym and we try to look our best and do our best. But Christ needs to be first. Every other relationship needs to be less than your love for Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying here. Or you cannot be my disciple, including your own life. We need to be second place. You know, compared to Jesus Christ, he needs to be our first love. Remember, he said that to the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 3. He exhorted that church, you have left your first love. You're putting other things before me. Think about that this morning. How many of us are putting things in front of Jesus Christ? He gave his all for us upon the cross. And we need to give our all for him. He died for you. We need to die for him too. We need to die to ourselves, our own desires, our own needs. You know, so, so many times we ask the Lord for resurrection power, right? Man, Lord, use me in a powerful way. And the Bible talks about resurrection power, but hey, before we experience resurrection power, what needs to happen? If there's a resurrection at the end, there needs to be a death at the beginning. And that death needs to take place in our own life. We need to die to ourselves. As John the Baptist said, I must decrease. He, Jesus, must increase. That's what he's talking about here. What does your relationship with Jesus Christ look like? I like to use this illustration. You know, so often when we're thinking about relationships... And I know that there's a few young people here or, or even, you know, even your marriage relationship this morning. We talk about body language, right? And maybe we see a couple that might, we might think is dating each other. Or maybe you say courting. However you want to call it, you know. Oh, they look like they're in love. Why do you think that? Look at the body language, right? Look at the goo-goo eyes they give to each other. The big smile. Oh, they can light up a room when that person walks in. Or they're holding hands or, you know, whatever. They're touching each other's hair. That's kind of intimate. Body language. What does your body language look like with the Lord? Are your knees 
found on the ground in a place of prayer talking to the Lord? Do you have your body in this church to be instructed by the Lord so you could discover what your part is in the mission of the church to go into all the world and to preach the gospel? Is your body being nourished as you open God's word and receive his instruction, the spiritual milk, the heavenly manna, the meat of God's word, the honey of God's word, the water of God's word. Everything you need is in God's word for godliness, the Bible says, Peter tells us. Does that mean the tacos are ready? (laughs) What does your body language say? Listen to this poem, William Cowper. He wrote a lot of hymns. He wrote this poem and speaking of this very thing, he says, the dearest object I have known, whatever that object be, help me to tear it from the throne and worship only thee. I love that. Putting Jesus first. Well, notice fourthly, verse 38 and 39. He goes on to the requirement, his requirement, the disciples' requirement. And here, notice what Jesus says, and he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it, and he who loses his life for my sake will find it. And here Jesus gives us the cost of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. Notice it involves taking up your cross. And that phrase, taking up your cross, means literally to die to yourself. It's not talking about your boss at work. Oh, I got to bear my cross every day. You know, my boss, he's, man, he gets on my nerves or gets on my case or whatever, you know. We, we think of it that way. Some, you're bearing your cross by something in this world. No, it, it's your cross. You need to die on that cross every day. Your will your agenda that's why we break the cup at communion right we're saying to the lord i'm a broken vessel lord i my will needs to be broken to your will that's the cross that we need to pray to bear in matthew 16 24 jesus said if anyone would come after me let him what first deny himself and then die to himself pick up his cross and then follow me We need to deny ourselves. We need to give up our life and fix our eyes on the life of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God that he uh, has for us. And so we need to do that. We need to die to ourselves. Think about what Jesus gave up in order for you to experience his life in you. He gave up his throne in heaven. He took on a human body to experience the things that we experience, hunger, thirst, pain, suffering, rejection. He experienced the suffering and the shame of the cross, the beaten that he took for you and for me. They bloodied him. They nailed him to that cross. He experienced death so that you and I can gain heaven eternal life think about that what he gave up in order to bring that life to you and hebrews talks to us about that it was the joy that was set before him he endured all of that because of the joy that was set before him and i want to just share with you guys that there is a joy in dying to ourselves, Man, have you ever tried to do things your own way? Have you ever tried to, you know, build something that you brought at Home Depot, you don't follow the instructions, oh, I got this. And then you're experiencing, you're pulling out your hair. Man, I should have followed instructions, right? I should have followed the instructions. Maybe it would have been better if I would have followed the instructions. This is our instruction manual for life. And God wants us to follow his instructions. And I love this passage. Write it down if you're a note taker. Hebrews 1.9. Because there 
the Bible tells us that Jesus was filled with joy more than all his companions. In the same way, you and I, as we follow his way, we're going to be filled with his joy. And he wants us to follow that joy as we daily die to our own way and follow Jesus. And so when you're telling people about the Christian life, guys, don't exaggerate it. Don't say that, man, if you follow Jesus, there's going to be free tacos. <laughs> there's going to be, you know, rice. You know, it's, it's beans and rice and Jesus Christ. All right? <laughs> Yes, we have free tacos today, but we don't have free tacos every Sunday. We do have free donuts and coffee every Sunday. But you know, the Christian life includes suffering. Yes, there's a crown at the end, but there's a cross on the way that we have to bear every day. And so it includes suffering. And this brings me to, our, to my last point. Notice fifthly in verse 40 in through 42 verse 40 he says what he who receives you we're talking about notice the reception of the disciple now his reception he says what he who receives you receives me and he who receives me receives him who sent me notice that Jesus equates people receiving you with people receiving him so in the same way, when people reject you, know that they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting Him. If you're living for Him, if you're bringing the gospel to others and living rightly and people reject you, man, they're rejecting Him. Don't take it personally. Remember when Saul of Tarsus who became the Apostle Paul remember when he was going to Damascus to persecute Christians what did Jesus say to him he said Saul Saul why do you persecute me Saul was persecuting the church yet Jesus said you are persecuting me he equates it personally to some people later in the judgment, Jesus will say to them, man, I was hungry and you fed me tacos. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. And that person might respond, Lord, when did we do that to you? When did we give you a, a drink and feed you? And Jesus says, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. You see, the way we treat others. We need to understand that when we treat a brother or sister in Christ, or even somebody who is made in the image of God, we need to realize that we're treating, you know, a, a, a creation of God, a child of God. We need to treat them rightly. Why? Because again, there's a reward. Notice verse 41 through 42, and we're done. It says what? He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. Verse 42, and whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of wa cold water in the name of a disciple Assuredly, I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. What a beautiful promise, right? And when we bless one another, when you bless your pastor or bless, you know, the, the greeters, the ushers, whoever, one another. And God sees every detail of what you do for him and for others. He writes it in his book of remembrance. And when he gives out rewards in eternity, when each of us have to stand before him, he's going to remember every little thing that you did. And he's going to reward you for it. And that's going to be a great time. I don't know how many crowns I'm going to receive. It might just be one of those Beetle Bailey things with a little propeller. But you know what? As long as I get in, I just want to get in. I just want to see my Savior face to face, the one who died for me. 
And I want to see all of you guys there. And I know we have family, we have friends in this community that we need to share with the love of Jesus because there's blessings in walking with Him. There's peace in knowing Jesus as our Savior that our sins have been washed away, that of sins that have been forgiven as we confess Jesus as our Savior and walk with Him as our Lord. We crown Him King. Listen, not every person who is a Christian is a disciple. Sometimes we just come to church, but we're not really students of the Lord. We haven't really crowned Him and say, Lord, Jesus, you are the Lord of my life. He might be your Savior, but is He your Lord? Have you crowned Him King? Are you dying to yourself and picking up your cross, as Jesus said? That is a disciple. Dying to yourself. It's not just believing in the truth in God's Word. The Bible says even the demons believe in Jesus and tremble. And our faith needs to go further than that. Not just believing in the truth, but obeying the truth. Amen? And then not just obeying, but growing and putting it into practice and doing what Christ has called us to do. Sharing with somebody else. Confessing Him before men so that we could have a reward in heaven. That's what Jesus desires from us. A growth, a progression, a maturity in our walk as we continue to believe and to hold on to the truth and apply it to our life and allow the Holy Spirit to transform and to change us into His image, the image of Jesus, so that we look like Him. So that when people come into contact with you, whether in this church or outside of this building, because we're not just, you know, the, the church isn't just the building, it's us. We are the church. And as we go out into this world, we want people to come into contact with the Jesus that lives inside of us, the Holy Spirit that overflows our life. And so let Jesus love on you and flow through you to others. Amen? Let's pray, and as we do, I'm going to pray uh, a prayer for us. But I'm also going to pray and ask the Lord's blessing upon the food that we're going to receive. For those of you that don't know, we have tacos outside that people are preparing that we want to give away. And so as Kaylin had said in the announcement, there's still time to call up your neighbors, your family members, your grandmother, your uncle, to say, hey, come on down. We're at Drake and Stover. Free tacos, bottles of water. There's going to be a coffee cart, I think a snow cone cart on the way. And we want you to just hang out, fellowship, get to know each other, encourage each other in the Lord. There's going to be pastors and leaders up here at the front after the service. If somebody needs prayer, you come. I'm going to ask the worship team to come at this time. And let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you this morning. We thank you for your word, Lord. And I realize, Lord, that there may be some of us here who want to respond to this word this morning that you gave to us by your spirit. You put your finger on places in our hearts that we have thought about, that we're thinking about, that need to change. And Lord, we ask you this morning, by your Holy Spirit, to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from our sin. And Father, to come in afresh in our life and overflow us, Lord. Help us to change. We need your power. We need your strength because we can't do it on our own. As your word says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, we need to be strong in the strength of the Lord because we have a spiritual enemy out there, Satan and his demonic spirits that we're fighting against, and we need the power of God to fight against them. And so we ask you this morning, Lord, that you would fill us with your strength, 
Enable us, Lord, to walk in obedience to your word. And if there's anybody here this morning, Lord, that doesn't know you, that needs to confess you as their Savior, as their Lord, then I pray for you this morning that are seated in those seats. If you don't know the Lord this morning, then you can know him. All you have to do is believe that he died for you. He was nailed on that cross and shed his blood for your sin, for your wrongdoing. And the only way that we can get to heaven is by believing in the sacrifice that he suffered on that cross for your sin. We can't get to heaven in our own works, our own good works, our own good behavior. Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me, Jesus said. You have to believe in him and his finished work upon the cross. He died, he buried, he was buried, and he rose again. That's what you have to believe. And then just begin to walk with him. And if you believe this morning for the first time, then... Let somebody know. Let one of the pastors know up here up front before you leave. Father, we ask your blessing upon the food that we're about to receive. We thank you for this time in your word, the spiritual food. Now we want to partake of the physical food, Father. Nourish our bodies physically. Give us strength spiritually and physically. Bless our fellowship. Bless everything that goes on. May everything go on safely and peaceably and lord shower us with your love as people pass by here may they wonder what's going on at this church and i pray that you would bring people father add to your church daily those that would be saved as we let our light shine for you we ask this in jesus name amen why don't we all stand we'll close in one song and you can consider yourselves dismissed
stand amazed by you And mercy new with every day Wrapped up in your arms of grace Nothing more, you're all I need